Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a wonderful little four-disc box on Capriccio that fills in a really important gap in the history of music, and it's an enjoyable gap. I like fun gaps. I don't want, like, boring gaps or, you know, what they say is the, you know, when, when people say things are of historical interest, it's because they're of no interest to us today. That's not true. This is both historical and interesting for us today. It is Symphonies Concertante by J.C. Bach, the youngest son of Johann Sebastian, also known as the London Bach, although he got around for quite a while. You know, he was only 14 when when his dad died, and he went to live with his brother, C.P.E. Bach in Berlin, um, who gave him some more training in addition to his dad. And then he wound up in Milan, um, where he converted to Catholicism, much to the consternation of some of his family, and then moved to, the, to England, where he established what were known as the Bach and Abel concerts in the 1760s. And from there on, you know, the rest is history. I mean, he was incredibly popular in his day, mostly as a composer of operas, believe it or not. And he was instrumental in training and meeting and being friendly with the young Mozart. I mean, he really got around. And he had a very good reputation until, of course, he was completely forgotten and ignored, like most of these people were. <clears throat> One of the reasons he was forgotten and ignored, I got this box here, it's really cool, is because he was known as somebody whose style was gallant or Rococo, or something like that, which was supposed to mean, you know, elegant and charming, but thoroughly superficial. I mean, for example, if we look at these symphonies concertante, of which there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, a couple concertos mixed in with them, but 16 works. None of them are in minor keys, for example. That doesn't mean there isn't music within them that's in minor keys, or that he couldn't write a beautiful, affecting, pathetic melody. He could. And there are plenty of these in here. But, <laughs> but none of it's in minor keys. <clears throat> yes, it's gracious. Yes, it's elegant. Yes, it has charm. I don't consider that to be a defect. You can do all of those things without being cheap and superficial. And I don't think that that J.C. Bach was either of those. I really, really don't. So let's just have a look at what's in here. The performers are the Budapest Strings um, with like famous Hungarian soloists, particularly Lajos Lensis, the oboist, who's kind of well known. And there's Janos Balint and Bella Banfalvi. No one you can know about and you're not gonna care who they are. But the truth of the matter is, it's lovely music and it's very nicely performed. And, and just as an example, um, first of all, what is a Symphonia Concertante? Well, that is a cross between a symphony and a concerto, usually with more than one soloist. So it's a symphony basically where the first desk players, whether they're winds or strings, have important solo parts which are which are you know worked on throughout the course of the piece. Now, the early versions of these things only had two movements. But uh, JC here tend to prefer the three movement version, although there's some here with two movements as well. But they're not small works. They're not inconsiderable works. They're rather larger than his symphonies, actually, the works that he called symphonies. But just to show you the wonderful variety of stuff in here, let's, let's just run through this briefly. On disc one, you get a Symphonia Concertante for two oboes, cello and orchestra. And then there's flute, oboe, violin, cello, and orchestra, and two violins, oboe, and orchestra, and then finally, finally violin, cello, and orchestra. And these have anywhere from two to three movements, but they're rather lengthy works. I mean, they're, they're, they're routinely 15, 20 minutes long or longer. There's one that's 25 minutes. I mean, they're as big as any, any you know, sort of symphony or, or, you know, concerto of the period. They were written mostly in the 1760s and 70s, often as interludes um, or you know, interact music for performances of J.C. Bach's operas, just as with Handel's concertos, for example. So CD2, we've got one for two flutes, two violins, cello, and orchestra. And the orchestra, by the way, also has like wind parts and horns and bassoons. I mean, it's very colorful music. It really is. Um, then we have a concerto, a più instrumenti, um, for two violins and orchestra and another Symphonia Concertante for two violins, cello, and orchestra, then flute, oboe, bassoon, and orchestra, 
And in CD3, we have two clarinets. The orchestra had clarinets. Primitive clarinets, granted, but clarinets. Two clarinets, two horns, bassoon, and orchestra. I mean, these are not easy parts. You need good players to do them as well. Then I've got two violins, cello, and orchestra, and two oboes, two horns, two violins, two violas, cello, and orchestra. That's a biggie. And it's a weird structure. It's actually subtitled Noturno. It's more a serenade. It has a big, long, like 10-minute long Andante opening movement, followed by three minuets. Yeah. So there you go. And then we've got, let's see, flute, two violins, cello, and orchestra. And on disc four, here's the biggie. Piano, oboe, violin, cello, and orchestra. That's 26 minutes long, 25 and a bit minutes long. Major, major work. Um, and let's see, we have two oboe concertos, and then two flutes, two violins, cello, and orchestra. So you can, you can see, they're tremendously varied, and they're very, very nicely performed here. And, you know, one of the interesting things about this is, that, you know, we, we tend to look down on music that falls between periods, between, say, the high Baroque, represented, of course, by like J.S. Bach and Handel, and the and the classical period represented by Haydn principally and Mozart and those people, which happened around the 1770s, 80s. And, you know, we look down on it because it, there's no rules for what the music's going to do. It's, it seems to be somewhat inchoate to us because it doesn't follow a, a pre-set pre pattern. But of course, the reality is that the music that made the rules from the classical or Baroque period also follows no preset pattern. It follows the free fantasy of the composer. They just happen to have a musical language of a, with, a, with a greater degree of, of organization. But within the, in the framework that they're operating, they're just as free. But here, it's the framework itself that is fluid. And I find periods like that fascinating because the music is in this sort of state of becoming and you're never quite sure what you're going to get. And it's very, very interesting to hear some of the formal experimentation or partial, even if they're partial successes. You know, what, what the classical period gained, the later classical period gained that this music doesn't have to the same degree is tension. This sense of, of, of forward movement, driving inexorably to a goal, which is always kept in suspense until the end. That particular kind of tension required a certain formal organization that J.C. Bach was instrumental in contributing to, but hadn't quite achieved yet. So his music tends to sound rather more relaxed. Big deal. <laughs> it's lovely music. It's marvelous music. And I think you're going to enjoy it very much. This is just a delightful little set. So... J.C. Johann Christian Bach, Symphonies Concertante on Capriccio with the Budapest Strings. Good stuff. Keep on listening, friends. Take care.